Welcome to DABCC Radio, where smart people listen. Virtualization and Cloud Talk, featuring cutting edge solutions from the hottest companies around the globe. Broadcasting from the DABCC offices in sunny Sarasota, Florida. Surrounded by computers, books, and Legos. A Microsoft MVP, Citrix Charter CTP, VMware V Expert. And your host, Douglas Brown. Hello, everyone, and welcome to DABCC Radio. We have a fabulous show. We have well, one of my favorite people in the entire world on the show today, One of the, a guy that I truly look up to and a, a guy that whenever I get a chance to talk to, talk with, I don't talk to him, I talk with him. Whenever it's, anytime I get a chance to listen, I stop what I'm doing and I listen. And it's a true pleasure to have Simon Crosby, uh, one of the co-founders of Bromium with us, and uh, the founder, uh, one of the co-founders and creators of the Zen Hypervisor with us, and, uh, and a former Citrix CTO with us, Simon Crosby. Uh, phenomenal guy. And today he's going to talk about security, um, Bromium, his current company, and what they're up to, what's new, and how this relates to you, right, in the, in the VDI and in the server virtualization world. And, uh, and just education, edu- educate us <laughs> in, in general. Uh, about everything that's going on in, 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 in the world today relating to security. So Simon is what you call an expert, and I use that word lightly. So with no further ado, here's my interview with Simon Crosby from Bromium. Okay, Simon, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It's been a while since you've been on the show, so I'm, l- I'm really looking forward to chatting with you. Thank you. It's great to speak to you. Oh, as always, it's truly my pleasure. So that being said, for those who might not know who you are, shame on them, as I always like to say, uh, who are you and what do you do over at Bromium? Well, um, my name is Simon Crosby. I was the, one of the co-founders of ZenSource, which was bought by Citrix. Um, went along that fabulous journey um, and popped out the far side to co-found Bromium. <clears throat> Bromium is a continuation in the, in the journey of virtualization, which I'll tell you more about as we go through this. Um, it's been a fascinating ride. But anyway, so I'm an ex citrite and uh, I love the community. <laughs> you know, I mentioned to you I'm, I'm headed over to Norway next week for the uh, Norwegian Users Group's 15th anniversary. And uh, one of the, the uh, sessions we have is a panel to talk about the past 15 years in, in Mark Templeton and some of the things he did. And so we uh, we were tasked, the panelists, myself and a few others, were tasked with thinking of some good stories about the past 15 years or, or things that Mark did that were, you know, really exceptional. And the one I'm going to bring up is uh, is the ex- acquisition of ZenSource. So I think yeah, that, uh, which is really, it's it's a, in the Citrix world, it's a, you know, uh, some people think they shouldn't have paid that much money for it. Some people, like myself, thinks it's the best money the Citrix ever spent. So I have a whole... You know, 10-minute conversation <laughs> around that one. You know, nothing's ever worth what you spend on it, but <clears throat> it certainly doubled the value of the Citrix stock. I mean, in Mark's own words, I think Citrix went, he said Citrix went from not to hot um, that's, that's with ex- the acquisition. And, and it doubled the equity value of the company. So certainly they got all of their money back for free within, actually within days of announcing it. Yeah. Um, and then it was, you know, it was it was a fun ride. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely. Uh, not the, the way, hot is perfect. Yeah, entirely independently of that, you should chat to Sunil. Oh, I guess he's left Citrix, but uh, you know, the guys who run Netscaler, a very substantial portion of Netscaler revenue now is dependent on Zen Server. Why, why is that? Just on, um, because it's in the box. Ah. So. <clears throat> Um, and they have the virtual appliance capability, but actually all of the high-performance Nescala boxes and all of the software functions all run the hypervisor. So let's just say that Nescala's ability to quickly morph between different feature sets and support high-performance networking and everything else is all entirely due to Zen. Makes sense. Makes sense. If they didn't have that, how would they How would they do that? They'd have to get something. So... Uh... It's a, the acquisition just keeps paying off. 
So for yeah. all the distractors out there, we're right. The best buy ever. Hey, so. You know, it, look, if the goal was to put a lid on VMware, oh my God, did we succeed. Yep. Seriously, we put a lid on them. Yep. You know, the world's the biggest clouds, and it's not just AWS. Yep. Yep, and, I agree. And, and, uh, and my goodness, did that put a crimp in the style of the folks at VMware. Yep. So yes, it succeeded. It succeeded fabulously. And as I keep saying to my friends at VMware, I actually think Zen is winning. Really? Well, you know, I want to talk about Bromium, but I have to ask why. Well, you know, how? Why do you think Zen is winning? <laughs> because it's everywhere, there, really, right? There are, you know, there are probably more servers running Zen than VMware in the world. Okay, and it's growing faster. It's growing massively fast. And more than that, we influenced quite very heavily the Microsoft Hyper-V roadmap. Um, and so to the extent that you say Hyper-V is, <clears throat> let's just say, architecturally similar to Zen, between the two of us, we sure clamp down on VMware, and they have no aspirations, no possibility ever of building a public cloud. They're toast. I mean, toast as in... They're stuck within the enterprise private cloud business. Interesting. Oh, I, I, you know, I, I have to ask, why can't they build a public cloud? Well, they tried, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's not, not that anybody cared. I think it was you could walk in there and swing a cat, and uh, you know, you wouldn't have hit a server. So, you know, ultimately, the cloud, the public cloud, is going to be run by big vendors. You know, there'll be AWS and Azure, and then there'll be bits of Watson and so on from IBM, and a few other folks will do things. But um, by the way, and most of China's public cloud is Zen based. Interesting. Uh, so, you know, VMware just doesn't count there, they just don't play. That's very interesting. And all that was due to, to, uh, to, to basically you and Ian, right? In a group uh, of others. No, I think it, it's not all, absolutely not that. It's all due to, um, you know, open source, to a fabulous community, to a bunch of people who are committed to delivering against an ideal and then going and doing it. And I was just lucky to be a surfer on the wave. I like it. I'm just lucky to be a surfer on a wave. That's a great, great saying. I'll steal that one from, from now on when I talk about, you know, my, my time at Citrix or whatever it's just. Happy to be a surfer on the wave. That's great. So let's talk about Bromium. So you sure. left you left Citrix five years ago. I remember yeah. when that happened. I was sad to see you see you leave. I thought, oh no, Simon, please don't go. And <laughs> yeah, you come me to me and you say, Doug, I'm building this company called Bromium. We're out of stealth mode. Let's talk about it. So for those who have not heard about Bromium, can you bring us up to up to date? Who is Bromium? Give us a little background on the on the company and the story behind find, founding it. You know, what are you guys trying to accomplish? Sure. So along the way, I, you know, we did all the VDI stuff and various other cool things, you know, as part of the group at Citrix that was fun. And we end up building a thing called Zen Client, which I would, loved Zen Client. <clears throat> oh, then you need Bromium, dude. <laughs> I really did. I really love Zen Client. I remember doing a, a podcast with Ian, actually. Okay. Ian so, Pratt, for those listening, Ian Pratt was one of the, the co-founders also of Zen and, and one of Simon's buddies. And and uh, we did a podcast, and he mentions this client hypervisor to me. And I stopped him. I was like, excuse me? Client hypervisor, what are you talking about? So, Simon, please continue. Tell the story. So, Zen Client is still used um, within some of the most secretive uh, government organizations um, as a massively secure virtualized client platform. Um, it's awesome. <clears throat> but it has this problem, which is that there isn't a human work practice on the planet that relates to getting a type one client hypervisor onto a box and then getting all the guests onto the box and managing all that trusted boot stuff and everything else and you know, managing this thing through its life cycle. So it's really, really hard to deploy at scale. Bromium <clears throat> basically occurred as a result of reflecting on that challenge, that is, if you're going to get any form of virtualization benefit on an endpoint, a client endpoint, you have to fit within the existing work practice of endpoint management um, and application management. And also trying to solve a slightly different problem, 
And the blinding insight was this, that we could use all of the hardware virtualization features that are on every client CPU, not to run VMs, as you currently are aware of them or think of them, but to hardware isolate individual tasks running within the operating system on the fly without the user knowing about it. So in a Brahmium world, on, on my, my unpatched Windows 7 endpoint, um, basically every time I click on anything, a URL, a document, whatever it happens to be, a new hardware isolated micro VM crea is created. It takes about <clears throat> 15 milliseconds on my PC. And then I'm up and running, and I'll, it may be a tab in my browser, it may be a Word doc, whatever it happens to be. I'm in a micro VM. And a micro VM, the way you want to think of it is an instant in memory thin clone of Windows. So it's extremely cheap to create because all you're doing is you're copying the CPU state out of a logical VM0 into a new um, Intel VTVMCS, the hardware structures for virtualization. Um, it's just a bunch of pointers to stuff that's in memory already. It's Windows after all. And it's all uh, marked as read only. And so it just runs. And then we reach into it and we say, hey, you know, Word, go open me this doc, and we'll hand in just the one doc or something. And so a micro VM costs almost nothing to create. They just run in about 15 milliseconds. They take no space, and then they execute copy on write. So as they mess up memory or uh, kernel space or whatever, as they execute, they diff slightly, and the uh, any changes they made are made within their own memory context, which is hardware isolated by the CPU. <clears throat> so they're very efficient. Uh, I can fit a couple of hundred on my PC. And each micro VM uh, has no hardware access. So we don't want it to talk to the USB devices to turn on the webcam or anything else because it's going to be processing untrusted content. It has a virtual file system, which contains only what the task that is within the micro VM needs. So if it's a Word doc, then just one Word doc is in the user file system. If it's a website, say I'm going to Facebook, then the only thing that I need is the Facebook cookie. And then it has a virtual network, which we own. <clears throat> and the virtual network is configured in such a way that um, a micro VM cannot gain access to high-privileged networks. So there's no access to the corporate intranet or to any of your high-value SaaS sites like Salesforce or even the user's bank. Okay, and so, oh, and the user ID is random, and the SAM is scrubbed, so there's no credentials in there whatsoever. So it's just a low-priv environment in which you can go off and do something really fast, like render some random web page or open an attachment to your email or something or file from a, from a USB key. So the user sees no change in performance or user experience, but tasks can get independently hardware isolated. And then you have this extraordinarily resilient protection, which the CPU affords you, so that if malware shows up and blows up in a micro VM, it's a complete don't care. Okay, so by doing this, essentially what are you doing? You're doing micro segmentation of the network. Each one of these little tasks is effectively running in the DMZ. What you're doing is you're compositing the user interface. So for example, every single tab in my browser will be a different micro VM or every document. Um, so we own the ultimate user experience. Um, and each one of these tasks has no access to any high value information, no files of value, no data stores of value, no shares, no enterprise networks of value, no sites of value. And so who cares if malware shows up and blows up in it? And so you get this extraordinarily resilient system which uh, the user think, uh, has no idea has been changed in any way, but which is totally safe when unpatched, running legacy software on an unprotected network and clicking on malware. It's totally cool. It is totally cool. Now, you said a few things I wanted. Well, first of all, w when, you, when you put these things in a micro VM, I think of like a softricity, right? And a lot of us are going to think of like a, you know, an app fee or a softricity where yeah. you create that virtualized bubble. And then in, re in return, you have the compatibility issue where if there's something not inside this virtualized bubble, in your case, the micro VM, 
that we don't have access and in return we can't use those in some cases we do is this a issue with you guys and if so how do you work around it if not Good. how come yeah, great question. So this is not application virtualization, just to be very clear. Sure, sure. Every single form of application virtualization is vulnerable to a kernel zero day, for example. So if I want to take the platform down, all I have to do is get you a click on a malicious website, feed the kernel a poison font file, and you're going down anyway. Okay? And so if you want to make the system massively secure, Essentially, each one of these micro VMs has to have at least a view of a kernel. And, and so let me give you another way of thinking about a micro VM. Imagine you're on the top floor of a, an apartment building in Manhattan, and now you're, you're in a micro VM, basically. And I say to you, can you change the skyline of Manhattan? And I give you a dry erase marker. And you can draw on the windows. You can do whatever you want. Okay, so you can mess it up and you can, yeah, you can change the skyline of Manhattan, but you're not really changing it. You're just changing your view of it, right? And this is true for both kernel and user mode. So um, the cool thing is it applies both to kernel and user mode code and it applies to file system and a very efficient block diff coding. Now, as far as getting things into micro VMs, uh, when we drop our product in, so when we install it, we just install like an app. So you would... You might think like a Type 2 hypervisor, like Workstation or Vue um, or something like that. We reach down and we magically, we go through a thing which you could think of as an in-place P2V, as it were. <clears throat> but we're essentially finding all of the default MIME type handlers for any one of the scary MIME types. So Office. Uh, any one of the executable form formats like uh, PDF handlers, your media handlers, and uh, you know your media renderers and all that sort of stuff, your Java execution environment, all that stuff, all gets thrown into a pre-cache in-memory template. Now I'm going to invite you to think a little bit like Harry's, you know Harry Laban has been working on this thing um, at VMware, which is essentially these pre-cached disks which pre which contain the applications for an image right sure um so you pre-cache all of the mime type handlers in pages in memory ready to go and then a micro vm is basically a clone an in-memory fast clone and then the application is just mapped in mapped into memory not mapped into the hard disk uh, that is not viewed from the hard disk in the vm they're just mapped in and they are up and running in memory already Okay, and then you can just reach in and say, hey, go do this. Now, you pointed out application compatibility issues. Actually, there are none. It is quite literally the software that's running on your endpoint. But we do have to be able to deal with all of the MIME type handlers that you might want to use. So, for example, Firefox, Chrome, IE of any version, all the Adobe handlers and so on, whatever PDF reader you need to deal with, because we have to know what those MIME type handlers are going to be when we run content in the micro -VM. Very interesting, very interesting. You also said do you have no access to the inter in internet or even maybe internet. How do you how do you deal with that? I don't, that's, you know, leave it at that. Yeah, so let, let me make it real concrete. I go into the heart of your data center, plug into the physical LAN and browse, browse to Facebook. The tab in my browser is in a micro VM, okay? That micro VM has access to the untrusted internet only it cannot resolve or talk to any ip address on my intranet any of my high value SaaS services salesforce or whatever my bank or anything else so it's almost as though that task is running in the dmz it has no knowledge whatsoever okay. of the corporate network okay and literally that micro vm is live it lives on some crazy natted ip address space it's not aware of any other micro vms or of the host that it's running on so we are literally doing kind of NSX like micro segmentation of the endpoint network with no access by untrusted stuff to anything of value. Very interesting. Very cool. Makes sense. So uh, you also said it's really fast. And as you describe this, it sounds like there's some definite overhead, right? So can you describe yeah. what you mean by well, really fast? So it, it's all down to user experience, right? Anybody who's been in the Citrix world knows that one. Well, yeah. so um, 
you know, when you click on a, an, say, a compressed hourly link or something in Twitter, typically there are, you know, several decompressions of that URL. It would be one or more redirections through the web. And then finally, you get to some site which finally renders, right? Any one of those could attack you. And so we might need to throw you into two or three different micro VMs along the way. Um, the key thing is that the round trip time, or at least the user perceived latency of the web, is dominated by the round trip time with the web, and 15 milliseconds is nothing. You know, typically, yeah. if you can get if you can get a website to render in a in a second and a half, you're doing well. You're very well. It's native native browser, so 15, 15 milliseconds is nothing here. It just doesn't matter. And then there are other crazy things we do. So, for example, if it's a Word doc, um, which I get as an attachment to my email. We do when we when we initialize the system, we pre-cache in memory the pages for say each one of the MIME tap handles. So in this case, Word is sitting in memory, running, but stopped with all of its pre with all of its initial fonts loaded, ready to just suck in the document and, and render it. Okay, and so it's much quicker to open an untrusted document than it is to just open a trusted one and go out to the hard disk, load Word, and deal with all the, you know, the stuff of loading Word into memory and then opening a document. In our case, Word is already frozen in memory, and we just have to kick it up and say, go open this thing. And so typically, untrusted documents open faster. There are other really interesting consequences of the architecture on user experience. For example, if I send you a Word doc, and you want to edit it, say you're my lawyer, um, you get this thing which is click to trust and edit, which is basically an, ele an elevation of privilege. Okay? And in our world, you never have to do that. So I can send you a doc, you open it up, it's in a micro VM, you can do whatever the hell you like to it. And I never have to say click to edit because it's in a micro VM, and you can edit it. You can even save a local copy, and if you ever open it up again, it's going back in a micro VM. Okay, so we have to cache metadata for all untrusted content on the endpoint and preserve that forever, right? And it needs to be robust across reboots, in fact, robust across traversal around the enterprise, um, and robust even to different file system types, um, because if you use NFS, you lose, you know, file system metadata. Mm -hmm. So we have to do all that and, and retain provenance uh, forever. We have to do other crazy things too. If you want to print an untrusted document, it could attack the printer. And so we have to manage the print job. <laughs> Does this r remind you of, of, of Citrix printing woes? Um, <laughs> the printing still to, makes me shiver. The word. Uh. Shiver, right. um, <clears throat> so basically you would print, we would handle a complete print dialog and then we flatten the document effectively into XPS, Microsoft XPS take that out of a micro VM, we'll send that to the printer and then destroy it. Um, we have to do the same thing for copy and paste, so we own the clipboard. The clipboard can only be used with a human at the keyboard. It cannot be program programmatically manipulated. Um, so there's no way that malware can use the clipboard to jump to high privilege. Um, but for example, if I go to Google image search, and then copy an image in a JPEG, and I'm going to paste it in my PowerPoint. Um, we can we'll force it through a format conversion, right, to make make it impossible for malware to jump through. Yeah. So we do all sorts of crazy things there. So any way from low to high, in from an untrusted um, ingress to the system, we have to we have to be in the way. Very interesting. You also mentioned uh, something you can do around 100 micro VMs, I think, was what, how you phrased it. Is there a well, scale I, issue, or is that just you threw that number out there? Uh, there are lots of challenges. Um, let me explain some of them. So I could fire up Chrome and get a couple hundred tabs up, right? And so after a while, if, I leave, if I'm one of those people who leaves Chrome running forever, right? Oh, for day those, day, those copy on write micro VMs are going to they grow over time, right? And so um, over time, they're going to take more and more space. Moreover, <clears throat> any machine has some maximum memory available, and we have to manage, we might have to manage the working set of micro VMs, okay? So we do all sorts of crazy stunts. For example, if you have 200 
tabs in your browser open, we will evict most of them from memory. Okay, and they get thrown out as essentially rotted blocks written into a known hard disk location that are uninterpretable from the host operating system. Um, and the key here is to be able to page them in and get them running if you ever jump back to a tab, right? So yep. you jump back to a tab, what do you see? You sec effectively, you see the tab as it was when you last looked at it, and then you go and click on a URL to go someplace, um, at which point, you know, we have to be there and we have to respond to the click within your user expectancy, within your UX expectancy. And it turns out we can do it, you know. And I, I mean, most PCs today are flash-based, or at least the drive is 5400 RPM, and and it's fine. It's it's fine to do that. We need a device with four gigs of memory to be able to do this. Um, you know, it's just too hard and anything less. Yeah. You would you see that to be a problem in 2016? Four gigs of RAM. Uh, no, not not for new devices. By the way, four gigs. We often find VDI VMs at four gigs. Yeah, um, or even less. Um, no. So in general, nowadays you can't buy a device with less than that. But you wouldn't. You know, it's shocking how pathetic the user experience is that some organizations give to their users. So we find organizations where they've you know got two gig laptops or two gig endpoints. Um, you know, for their Taskish workers because they don't need to do much. I mean, it must suck, but nonetheless, that's what they do because they can save, they can save, you know, some amount of money on hundred yeah. thousand devices, you know. Yeah, and they're probably legacy devices, as you mentioned, because you can't really buy a new one with just less with less than four gigs today. Yeah. So, uh, um, and then the, my last question from from your original statement. Uh, uh, talking with you is great. I always have like ten follow ups to everything, every you know major statement you say. Uh, um, are there any apps or functionality uh, that just does not work with Chrome? Uh, um, no, by now we're good. Um, but let me tell you some horror stories. Oh, um, I love those. So, by the way, just to be clear, in the nest, in a VDI world, we're nesting, right? So, per VDI VM. We are then nesting the Bromium microvisor, which, by the way, is just an extension of, well, it's a cut-down version of Zen. It's called MicroZen. Well, that's going to be my next question is how do you work with VDI? So uh... it, works, it works fine. We just turn on nesting per VM. And so in the case of VMware, it's been supported for a while. In the case of Citrix, we've worked with the Citrix guys to get it into Zen server, and uh, we are in trials with several customers to get that all turned on. Um, the feature is there. The initial implementation in, in mainline Zen wasn't awesome, so we optimized that. In Hyper-V, we've been working with Microsoft to get nesting into Windows Server. So it'll be in Windows Server Hyper-V uh, in 2016. That's currently in technical preview. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. So so basically, there's you know pretty much everything's going to work, and, and you work just fine with VDI. Uh, well, actually... It's much more complicated than that. <laughs> well, bring us up to speed, Simon. Okay. Educate so, us. So, well, I want to tell you a horror story first. Okay. So, ultimately, if there's, you know, you want to throw all these apps into VMs, ultimately, the worst app is the browser. It's a complete hog. Um, and the worst thing in the browser is flash based ads. They're just desperate. Or even just go to CNN.com and a video plays, right? So there are tons of things we do to optimize there. And you can go on, in, on a, in a Bromium world, you can go all the way to the point, which is how I configure my world, where I never see an ad and anything which is Flash is click to play. So all of the stuff which would make Flash not, it's there. If you want to run it, you can run it, but you're going to have to click on it to run it. We can do all those crazy things, right? And once you start taking resource away from, so I mean, the browser typically takes a gig on its own, but you can radically cut it down if you start to get rid of some of the, the BS which um, you know, the media vendors and the ad guys throw at you. And then you know, the, the browser is awesome. Browser plugins are hard, very difficult, but we're there too. Um, so why is virtualization on the client hard beyond this? Um, the big thing is Windows 10. And the big move to Windows 10 
relates to other work that we worked uh, did with Microsoft. So specifically, Windows 10 under an enterprise license has a thing called um, Device Guard with virtualization-based security in the OS. Okay, and okay. I am I think this is going to shaft all of the EUC vendors. Oh, not Microsoft. <laughs> it's going to shaft Citrix and VMware. Okay, because what happens is under an enterprise license, when you boot Windows 10, um, what happens is the hypervisor gets turned on. So Hyper-V gets turned on. This is just on a Windows 10 client. And two Windows services move into micro-VMs. Okay, so that one is LSAS, which is the credential store for derived AD credentials. And the other one is the code integrity service, which does kernel mode white listing. And so these things run outside of Windows in essentially a micro VM, all right? You don't know about it. It just happens when you configure it appropriately. And so by default, any Windows 10 new OEM hardware that ships, ships with this turned on, okay? Well, if you plan an enterprise license to it, it turns on and no other hypervisor will run. Interesting. Okay. So, um, we have done a ton of work to make sure that that, uh, that we can work with that, uh, extending essentially seamlessly extending uh, Hyper-V um, and, and providing the ability to run, to do micro VMs or extend our use case to micro VMs. So we can just run there. In um, what, in why does that shaft VMware and Citrix then? I think I know, but I want to make sure. Well, there are several things. First of all, in Windows 10, there is a mandate for a UEFI-based secure boot. Almost all of the virtualization platforms today, actually, <laughs> except for Hyper-V, support a BIOS-based boot. Okay, When you move to UEFI and you move to GPT formatted hard disk, which is incompatible with BIOS. Okay, So VMs and, and endpoints that, are, uh, that have a essentially an MBR formatted hard disk will never, ever, ever run in a, UF, in a UEFI configuration. When you move to a UEFI-based boot, then a bunch, you can do a secure boot, but also then you can turn on this um, virtualization-based security. So problem number one is UEFI, and uh, neither, I think neither Citrix nor VMware fully prepared yet to deal with this big change. Second, the turning on of the client hypervisor means there is another hypervisor there. And by the way, it's called Hyper-V. And if you happen to want to run your hypervisor, you're in trouble. <laughs> right? Interesting. So, and this is challenging. Um, it's challenging for end user endpoints. So it's challenging on PCs and so on, PCs and laptops, but also challenging in a VDI environment because it will mandate nesting. Otherwise, you cannot use uh, config, uh, Credential Guard and WCIS, essentially this virtualization-based security with Windows 10 VDI guests. So there's work to be done there. Very interesting. Very interesting. Huh. Well, I, I have to say, Steve Jobs was right. Flash does suck. <laughs> when he came out and said that, I was like, come on, I love Flash. No, no, I don't. Flash, Flash, Flash disks are awesome. Flash... Well, actually, if you would take one company and blame it for, if you had picked the worst company in the industry from a security perspective, it would have to be Adobe. Oh, I have friends at Adobe. Adobe. I will email them that. <laughs> <laughs> and why are they still my friends? <laughs> or why why am I their friend? As I taunt them. Yeah. Um. That's very interesting, Simon. That's very in interesting. So basically, Windows 10 just would not run on those hypervisors then, right? Is that what you're saying? Uh, Windows 10 will run on a VMware hypervisor with nesting turned on per VM. The performance there is unknown. Um, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Um, Zen Server, I believe, the, so the feature is in mainline Zen. It's experimental in Zen Server, and I believe they have plans over the next year to get it to production. Um, and then, you know, if you happen to be doing things like um, View or Workstation, 
or VirtualBox. Bye bye. Interesting. And, they, and how will those guys work around that? Is it possible, or we just that that industry is kaput? No, Mike, uh, Microsoft will pull the uh, nesting feature set back into the client OS at some point, but we just don't know when. Okay, makes sense. Makes total sense. Okay. But nonetheless, nesting is always less optimal yeah. from a performance perspective. So, we'll, you know, there's a lot to be seen. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Simon, you're a wealth of knowledge. I love it. So uh, I like I like what you're talking about. This sounds really interesting. What but, by I, the way, go one ahead. other thing, Doug, you just, it's not only about nesting, okay? So the, the big thing here is the UEFI change. So um, – even if you're a normal enterprise and you've got a bunch of Windows 7 or Windows 8 devices and you want to upgrade to Windows 10, um, you could install Windows 10 on a BIOS-based um, disk sure. and with the BIOS-based boot, but you can't get any of the advanced security features. Okay, okay. And so if you wanted to go to UEFI, that's manually messing with the firmware and then um, re-imaging the disk to use GPT and then turning on all this stuff, it's going to be a ton of work. So we'll see what happens. Very interesting. So you can do it, but you're asking for trouble. Well, you ask for trouble. It's it's you have to manually. As far as I'm aware, there are very few utilities which claim, with any degree of confidence, a high success rate at automating any of this. So to move from, um, you know, a GPT. Uh, MBR based disk to GPT based disk, you know, and, and re get get everything to go with UEFI, um, generally involves some manual intervention. Now, if you're dealing with a hundred thousand PCs, oh, you know, good luck, good luck with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That says it all. Um, okay, so this sounds great. What does it take to get up and running? How does the you know how does oh. can you describe the architecture like like what does it take to install sure. you know things like that? Take us through that process. Yeah, so we drop in like a type two. So you have a running Windows system, right? We do 7, 8, and 10, and we have a Mac product too. Um, so we drop in just like it, which just an application you install, and then we disappear. Now, it depends on whatever hardware you have available. So, for example, if you have an IOMMU, then we can really disappear because we can make the memory disappear from Windows. Um, but ultimately, the goal is the user never sees that. So we drop in, we sit in the background, and we initialize ourselves essentially building this cache this template of you know pre-pinned memory pages in uh you know up in memory that consumes a couple of megabytes of, of memory and then basically we drop a couple of uh filter drivers into the windows desktop os so that you know whenever you click on any one of these untrustworthy mime types so it's attachments um urls that sorts of things you know, we get it first and we throw those things into micro VMs, but the user doesn't see it. Very interesting. Very interesting. So do you guys have admin tools, reporting, yes. logging, things like that? Can you describe that process? Yeah. So, the, you know, this all sounds like cool virtualization stuff. For the security person, that's kind of ho-hum. Sure. The best thing for them is that we get to do something which is – so let me describe the current security world. Right now, malware morphs in under a minute. Okay, not more than 99% of malware morphs into a new polymorphic form in under a minute. Okay, so the chances that you ever get signatures from your AV vendor that are of any value at all are basically is basically close to zero. So what do you mean by that? It hits my machine and then it morphs? Oh, but... 97% of malware is is polymorphic to the user machine that is you will never you won't see the same hashes anywhere else in the organization um, but 99% of all malware changes shape every time it executes okay so in under a minute it will change into a new form and propagate itself somewhere and you will never see it again okay so the whole detect to protect paradigm is totally busted it's gone it's finished 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 and what we've seen over the last year has been a massive increase in malware reaching the endpoints because we sit right at the back. You know, there's hundreds of millions of dollars of next-gen firewalls and IDSs and all this other stuff in front of us, but now it's all just flying through to the endpoint. So the security world 
of interest to the security practitioner is that their existing methods to protect the endpoint have failed, yet 90% of breaches begin with an endpoint, okay? Because that's the way in, then you get the user to click on something and then you dig into the network. Um, so in a, in a world where detect to protect has failed, um, isolation of the form that I've described is extraordinarily valuable because it lets you do something um, really cool, which is let the attacker actually exploit the actual software on the actual end user endpoint in a safe way. Okay. Meanwhile, you're recording every change to memory, every packet sent or received, every touch on the virtual file system and the registry. You have it all. We have it all for every single one of these tasks. Okay. And so we get to do something that AV can't do. AV tries to detect to protect. We just simply wait for it to do something really bad. At which point it's blindingly obvious that it's bad. You can do it with zero false positives and you have a complete forensics for the task as it exploded in front of your face. Okay, so I can just click on CryptoLocker, for example. You know, it may or may not be CryptoLocker, but once it does bad stuff, it's blindingly obvious, okay? And at which point we've recorded all these attempted changes by the malware, and we have live forensics, which the microvisor then kicks up to the security team, okay? Now, the awesome thing about micro virtualization is the moment the user closes that application or the task in their browser, um, zeros get written into memory. So the system self remediates. So it cleans itself up, but we have got complete forensic information for the attack. And then from that centralized perspective, we go and search the enterprise in real time to see if we see that same thing anywhere else. Because everybody's got some shitty old Windows XP boxes which you can never protect, right? Or some thin clients or some point of sale terminals. And so then we go and search in real time. So from the security practitioner's perspective, the change to isolation based security gives you an opportunity, opportunity to change the game in terms of identifying, uh, detecting where you're vulnerable because we see what software is being breached and then getting full forensics and which you can use to search other systems. Very interesting. And and you but but you mentioned that malware changes and morphs itself within, you know, seconds. Yes. So how would you be able to use that information and then in return find it in other places? Wouldn't it be different yeah. in those other places? No, so let's just be clear. So here give me I'll make this concrete. A thirty a piece a thirty two byte piece of malware has more than two to the two hundred and forty different signatures, okay? And there are only two to the 80, you know, atoms in the universe, okay? okay you just so, lost me, but oh, let's continue. <laughs> okay, so there are more, a 32-byte piece of malware, yeah. you have more signatures than there are atoms in the universe, okay? So okay. it's not doable. Okay, so what happens is that the malware changes its binary signature, as it were, it, right, very quickly. But the malware behaves similarly in okay. many ways, okay? Yeah. That is, what it's trying to do when it persists is write particular values into certain registry keys, or it's talking to a particular set of CNC servers, or it's trying to access certain credentials. Okay, those patterns of behavior you can learn from, and indeed we do use machine learning type technologies to try and figure those out, but you can learn from that, and even though something changes its binary signature, it will still behave the same way because it is the same attack. So I'm going to learn so much every single time. This is great. I hope. Well, I know everyone out there listening is learning along with us. So this is great stuff. Well, so, it's a great pleasure. I have uh, I have a few questions that are more generic around the security world. I think in some ways you've answered some of these throughout the the podcast. So if I if I ask a question that you've answered, you just sit down. We talked about that or, or what have you, right? Or maybe well, I know you will give us more info. So uh, you know, every day we, what we we're hearing of security breaches, right? You know, uh -huh. it's the biggest. I mean, I can't open up my phone in the morning in bed when I'm sitting there and not see something hacked or, or something of that nature. Uh, you know, uh, um, how is Bromium different than the other companies? And it, you've definitely answered this one. But anything else to say there? 
Now, just one thing, you know, every year we hand out our source code <coughs> and the products to the world's best pen testers, and nobody has managed to pen trade it yet, right? So this is pretty wild. So, you know, our customers tend to be the most demanding security orgs. And so, we're, you know, we're radically different than any other approach out there. But by the way, that doesn't make it easy. Um, it requires a customer who's prepared to invest in the intellectual process of understanding how it works and then invest in the process of actually deploying new stuff to the endpoints. And, you know, the average average Joe just wants AV because, you know, if they have AV, they're compliant and they won't lose their job. Where do you think the security segment is right now? You know, uh, in, and of course, where do you think we're headed within the next five years? And then, of course, how does uh, Bromium fit into that? So security is pretty pathetic right now. Um, now, that's the result of, at the highest level, the fact that the operating systems and endpoint systems that we use weren't, were built before the Internet. They were not built to be manically attacked. Okay. And so the one thing you do know is it gets better going forward. You are not worried about malware on your iPhone. Why? It's a better system. Okay. If a nation state wants on, fine, they'll get on. Just accept it. But we can raise the bar very high by having better systems. So part of our work with Microsoft is essentially to start making the platform just a whole lot more resilient in its own right. And I think that we're on the breach of that. On on the on you know it's it's all coming. But the problem is to get enterprises to move forward, and they are so tied down with legacy nonsense. Let me give you an example. If you use Oracle ERP eleven, you're stuck on Java seven on the client forever, which means you're host. I mean, just try to tell your CFO you need a new ERP system to get rid of malware, right? Yeah. So. The problem is to get enterprises to move forward. Now, the cool thing about micro virtualization is you get to apply it to the legacy software base in a very elegant way. Over the long term, the world gets better. We know this. We know, by the way, also that on the cloud side, it gets better too. You know, apps that are built cloud native with microservices and micro segmentation also use micro virtualization in the sense that Docker is a, a similar concept, right? And these things are ephemeral. They live for a short time and they're hard to find. If they get owned, they get thrown away in a heartbeat anyway, so nobody cares. So ultimately, we're moving towards more secure infrastructure. I think the key theme that I see contributing most strongly in the, in the near term is that we're still in a, at a point where the attacker is manual. So if you think about manual labor, the attacker is manual labor, okay? And there may be a lot of them, but you know, the more we can automate our systems by adopting ephemeral concepts, like in my case, you know, a tab in a browser is an ephemeral rendering and I throw the darn thing away and the system self-remediates. The more we can adopt these kind of automated approaches or automatically go and look for signs of a breach in the enterprise, using computer systems to help us do that rather than humans who are trying to go and explode malware on separate network segments to try and find out what the bad stuff is, you know, the quicker we can adapt. That is, if we can be automated in the malware and the bad guy is still a human who has to try and dig deeper you know, over a telnet session or equivalent, um, then we're winning. We'll win a lot. Ultimately, we need to accept that we will never uh, win every skirmish, but we need to be secure enough that we win more battles than they do. And that's not necessarily the case right now. Very interesting. And, you know, one of the other big trends in security nowadays, and you, gosh, there for a, a past few months, I think I've seen it almost every day, if not every other day, is ransomware. What's, yeah. what's going on with this thing? So ransomware, look, the emergence of ransomware is in a way directly related to the fact that the U.S. has finally adopted a more resilient um, payment card infrastructure. By the way, I'm not a huge fan of chip and sign. It's completely pathetic, but um, nonetheless, it's getting better. Okay. So the malware, for the malware writer who's always after money, um, it turns out that 
monetizing every single PC that you hit and compromise is an awesome way as opposed to trying to go and compromise an enterprise, go and dig around, try and find the credit card database, steal the credit cards, and then find that you know you can't actually exploit those for much money. So malware writers have turned to this very simple approach, this change in business model for them, where essentially if they can take advantage of a single user added advice for 150 bucks or whatever, they'll do it. And it's very interesting because the psychology of it in the enterprise is fascinating. Enterprise users are really embarrassed when they get hit by crypto locker. And so often the enterprise user will go off and try and buy bitcoins to get out of the problem. Rather than call their security department because they feel embarrassed that they might have clicked on something bad, they will go down this path of trying to deal with crypto locker. But, you know, uh, it's a it's a change of business model for the bad guys. We've seen about a 3,000% increase in crypto malware variants in the last uh, six months. And now it's happening everywhere, police departments and everything else. And we regularly see our customers get um, get hit by it. And, of course, if crypto malware opens up in a micro VM, it's awesome fun to watch because, you know, here's this thing off trying to encrypt files in a virtual hard disk that has no idea about. It. And it pretty soon gives up and you just close the document and you're done. Interesting. I just, just yesterday I was reading uh, Macworld magazine or two days ago and, and uh, there was a nice little utility. I don't know how well it works, but I guess it, it monitors for things being encrypted from untrusted sources. And if so, then it stops it. So, uh, Yeah, the problem, the problem with that is, you know, a- anybody who says I can detect, you know, my standard response is bullshit. That is, I, you tell me how it works. Do you within, within a second, I'll think of another way to make it work, right? Yeah. And so, and so, you know, there are lots and lots of sophisticated detection mechanisms out there. We can always move the world forward a step at a time, and the bad guy will respond with his latest step. Yeah. Ultimately, we're really going to change the game and get to massively secure infrastructure. You know, this is just straightforward. I mean, this is really robust. It's just a systems design tool. And you end up with systems which are naturally resilient, naturally self-remediating, and secure even though they can't be patched. So I'm in favor of you know radically changing the odds, in favor of the good guys, um, as opposed to linear increases in detection. Makes, it makes total sense, Barry. It makes total sense. You mentioned something I have to, let, I can't let it pass by, and we're closing the end of the, or we're close to the end of the podcast, so we'll digress for a second. But uh, you mentioned chip and sign. You you really dislike. Why? Well, it doesn't actually solve the security problem. By the way, in general, the there are other. I mean, there are other massive problems with the credit card system online. I mean, now even with chip and sign, most of the fraud has moved to online. That is, you know, you're trying to buy some tickets through Ticketmaster or whoever it happens to be, and they have a credit card. At which point, all of that stuff is invalid, right? We need to move to a much more secure mechanism for payments, and certainly Apple has figured out most of that. If we could have a scalable electronic payment system which does not rely on me actually typing in my credit card number and all the other digits on the card, we would be massively better off. But chip and sign doesn't really solve many problems. All it does is validate that the card is a real card yeah. from the provider, you know, at the terminal. And only in some terminals. So it's it's a minor step forward. It's fifteen year old technology and we ought to be going forwards faster, in my view, not adopting Partially adopting legacy stuff. Hey ho, makes sense. So, uh, so bromium. Every time I hear you talk about it, every time I hear anyone talk about it, I think to myself, well, why isn't everybody using this? Yeah. So actually, I, I have a simple answer to that. It's you know, um, imagine I was Elon Musk. Just wish, but imagine I was Elon Musk and I just pitched on all this cool electronic technology, which is going to be the future of how you drive a car. That's kind of what Bromium is, right? But you had to be a smart dude to get it and to understand and say, wow, I want to do that, right? Um, you know, if when I go to San Francisco, I, I take a taxi. The guy is driving a Prius. All you know is he gets better gas mileage. And ultimately, security technology needs to be built into systems, and systems need to be better. That is, you need to get better gas mileage, and you don't really need to think about all the cool tech, right? So Bromium is still... Bromium technology, we sell to the high end, people who really care 
and who are prepared to actually take the steps to actually distribute and deploy new security technologies to their endpoints because they're fed up with getting owned. But the average user also needs to get better security. And so one of the reasons we work with Microsoft was to start getting some of the core capabilities of virtualization-based security into the platform for everybody, right? So and we'll get there, um, but it's still the case that we're selling, uh, selling Teslas. Yeah. Well, that was going to be my last question is why doesn't Microsoft just acquire you guys and throw it in the core windows. <laughs> why, didn't Mike, why didn't Microsoft buy Citrix 10 years ago, Dougie? Well, there's a lot of reasons there because they didn't need them. They, you don't want – Microsoft has no business buying Citrix. They should never buy Citrix. Citrix is the best outside company Microsoft has. They right. build an industry and, and they uh, get the brunt. Is it, I guess I'm answering my question for you, right? Yeah, you so set from me him, up. From him, from, so – if you think about, think about some of the stuff I said earlier about UEFI um, boot and so on, you can't use one of the new security features in Windows 10. With, by the way, if you're an enterprise, security is really the only reason to upgrade the OS because the user applications aren't changing. Um, you can't use them if you unless you go to UEFI boot. And that, by the way, means new hardware or else you know a million monkeys doing UEFI config on the firmware. So Bramium is the way to accelerate a Windows 10 rollout because all we need is virtualization hardware, which is on every client CPU, and you get security, and you can accelerate your adoption of Windows 10. Really? So, so, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. So the whole point as far as I'm – I mean, so part of this partnership with Microsoft has been rediscovering kind of the, the kind of virtuous relationship that Citrix had with Microsoft, whereby what we do adds value to their franchise, and we're certainly at that point now where – you know, everything we do is compatible. We accelerate security. We accelerate the adoption of Windows 10 because you don't need to move to a UEFI boot to do it. You get all the benefits of hardware security, uh, and you can get the other benefits of Windows 10. Very interesting. Very interesting. Simon, you are a wealth of knowledge. I love having you on. I love chatting with you. You're one of my all-time favorite people to chat with. Uh, I've never, I don't think many people educate me as much as you do. I, I thoroughly love it, and I hope the guy's listening. And, Love it as much as I do. So um, we, we have last two couple questions that I always ask, as you probably remember, that's competition and future. Yeah. So uh, competition, I guess uh, I'll throw that at you. I guess it's the biggest competition doing nothing, right? Yeah, but, I think uh, that's true. I think that is true. Um, it's interesting. You know, in general, we, ha we do well when we find a CISO, a security guy, <coughs> who is empowered. Typically, that's an organization that has been broken into. Um, but if we have a CISO who, you know, who, who doesn't have clout in the org, it's not a good recipe for success. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, future. So, um, where are you going with this thing? Well, What's we, left to be done, I guess? Well, servers, um, we now have, gosh, let's see, uh, we have one deployment in the federal world, which is about 120,000 endpoints of which, say, 5,000 are servers, but taking the technology onto servers is important. This idea of ephemeral, lightweight, cheap hardware isolated structures for virtualization is critical on servers as well. Um, the Microsoft talks about something called Hyper-V containers, and that's key to their Docker strategy. So all of the same core technology is already in Server, T Server 16 TP4, it will go into Azure, I hope, next year, and it's going to be fundamental to hardware isolation of ephemeral Docker-based Windows containers in Azure, whether they're Linux or Windows. Cool. Very cool. And very last question. You mentioned uh, Bromium for Mac. Mm -hmm. How do I get a copy of this, and would I benefit from it personally? Oh, well, certainly, if you'd like to go and click on Crypto Malware, we'd be happy to... I don't like uh, to, but but I'm afraid I am. You know, uh, um, I don't I'll know, get, right? Yeah, I'll I'll get it to you, Dougie. I'm happy to hand it out to you. I would love a copy of that. I would absolutely love it. Is it? It and it's yeah. It just sits there and runs. I I yeah. I would well for one. I'd like to see it running. You know, I think that would be really neat to to actually get a hands on with this more so than conceptually speaking or even seeing it on a Windows 10. You know, actually use it myself. That's when you really. I would love that, Simon. Absolutely love that. So, um, uh, okay, last question. If somebody wants to learn more, if they want to try it out, can they try, you know, what do they need to do to, oh, sure. to go, yeah, ping, go forward? 
know, I'm Simon at Bromium. Um, or you can just go to our website. But yeah, delighted to let people try it. I mean, we actually what we do is we normally try out at the scale of, you know, tens or even a hundred people, just to make sure everybody's happy and it all works. And then uh, and then we go down the path of so we prove the value of it in some context, and then uh, go down the path of selling it. Is there a process to roll it out at scale? Um, it, we we just most people just roll us out. Using System Center. Okay. Um, our console also allows you to deploy our software from the console, but you have to deploy something, some the base installer as part of um, an SCCM push. Um, but we have customers who've done that, you know, to sixty thousand endpoints overnight. Perfect. Perfect. Now uh, uh, that that makes me ask, you know, selfishly ask a question. So I have a Mac. Do yeah. I have a backend component to the Bromium then? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And what what's the requirements there? Um, so our management stuff runs in the instance of Windows Server, typically as a VM, yeah. um, with SQL as the backend. And then we just use all the SQL clustering for very large deployments. Um, in fact, in one of our deployments, there's a Netscaler in front of it just to use load balancing in front of a bunch of VMs. But it's a very low-rate environment. I want to just be very clear. You know, in many IDS-type deployments, you'll be getting, you know, 100 alerts per user per year, say, which can be huge. In our world, <laughs> it's tiny. You know, we might get one or two per user per quarter. Very cool. Very cool. And, of course, that Netscaler is running Zen technology that you guys invented. <laughs> I had to throw that out, right? We talked about that earlier. Well, ultimately, virtualization is extraordinarily powerful. I happen to think security is the biggest value prop of virtualization. So let's see. Number one was server consolidation, huge. Number two is cloud, which is kind of agile, blah, 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 all the, anything, anywhere. And then three is security. And, and you've seen VMware talk about micro-segmentation with NSX. You see Docker talking about it and so on. Ultimately, moving to a virtualized you know, cloud or, or application environment is going to make us all more secure. Yeah. I remember the old CEO at VMware saying, um, the beauty of virtualization is abstraction, right? Yeah, and, that's right. And I think that's that's the best one of the best my favorite quotes I've ever heard. Yeah. So uh, that's totally true. And once you encapsulate, you know, abstract, then you can secure. You can do tons of different things with it. So that's what you guys are doing. That's beautiful. Simon, yep. thank you so much for taking. Hey, the time. Doug, it was a, a real pleasure and a great honor. Thank you oh, so much. For being no, back. The honor is all mine, and the pleasure is all mine. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Great to be back. What do I say? That concludes a fabulous episode of DABCC Radio. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I do. Talking with Simon is truly a joy. If you ever get a chance to meet this guy, he's one of the most approachable people I've ever met. And uh, that's, that's at the level that he is, right? He is, he's a true genius. He's a trendsetter in the, in the IT world. Uh, the guy is just downright fabulous in every way, shape, and form. And, and uh, a true honor to have him on the show. Uh, but it's, it's an even bigger honor just to sit and listen and learn from him. He opens your mind and, and makes you think. And so guys, I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, um, what else do I say? Definitely ch check out what Bromium is doing. Head on over to their website, www.bromium.com. Just Google Bromium and you'll find it. Google Simon Crosby and you'll find it, right? Um, it's just great stuff. Or head over to the abcc.com and you will find it. Um, what else do I say? Try it out. Have fun with it. Guys, definitely also check out the new DABCC.com. We have rebuilt it from the ground up, uh, literally from the ground up. It's 100% different. You might find some 404s because it's 100% different. But if you do uh, use that fancy search engine or we actually built in a really phenomenal a way of finding information that's sort of like going to Amazon and buying something on Amazon.com where we use checkboxes. So you can go in and you can say applications, security, Bromium, boom, there's all the articles. Or application security, Citrix, VMware, boom, there's all the articles, right? Uh, and so it takes 45,000 pieces of content and growing every day down to a sizable chunk that you can look through in just seconds, literally seconds. So it's a great way to find what you're looking for when you're doing research or just want a, a great article to read that's, that's pertinent to what you're interested in at that particular moment, right? So I really love it myself. I love using it myself, and I hope you guys do too. 
Uh, the feedback has been really great, and I like to say it's pretty, it's, it's beautiful, if I could be so bold. It's fast, it's easy, and it's powerful, and those were my goals there. So definitely check that out, www.dabcc.com, bookmark it, add it to your iDevice, your Android device, and check it on a daily basis. <laughs> and tell a friend, but what do I say? This is how we grow, tell a friend. We don't do advertising. It's all mouth, you know, hand to mouth uh, uh, type of uh, growth here. At the ABC. On that note, again, thanks Simon for making this one of my favorite shows, and thank each and every one of you for listening to the ABCC Radio. D-A-B-C. Say it again. D-A-B-C-C. D-A-B-C. Can you say it again? D-A-B-C-C. D-A-B-C. How about D-A-B-C-C? D-A-B-C. D-A-B-C-C. 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 D-A-B-C-C.